Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Hey folks, it is Shay again, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Casual Cattle Conversations. Today, we are visiting with Andrew Uden, and we're going to be talking about Herd Dog, and that is a company that he is really leading the charge with. It's a technology company, but in addition to talking about Herd Dog, we are really going to be diving into the challenges we face as ranchers more than anything. So we're going to start off the conversation talking about the challenges that ranchers are facing, what it looks like, what it means for us, and kind of steps we can take to get ahead of those in the years to come. And then Andrew's really going to dive into some of the options for technology, whether it's your very simplistic forms all the way up to collecting a lot of data like her dog can do for so many cattle producers and how that can play a role in different operations. So this producer is really for any of you cow-calf producers who are just interested in how to get ahead of the game in the coming years and be more efficient with your time. So with that, let's visit with Andrew. All right, Andrew. Well, good morning. It is great to have you on the show today. And we're going to be talking a little bit about your background in the beef industry, which is unique and diverse. But really, I'm excited to talk about the egg technology side of things, specifically with herd dog and really how technology is finding its place in the cow calf industry specifically. So, so thank you for hopping on today and having this conversation. Thanks for having me, Shay. I'm Excited to have the conversation and uh, be on the show. All right. Well, I know right now you are in Western Nebraska, but you you travel a lot. You have lived in a lot of different places and done a lot of things. But let's start with where you're at today. So kind of what does life look like for you briefly um, related to the beef industry? I know it might be hard to say briefly with as much as you're doing, but as far as what you're doing in the beef industry today, can you kind of share with the listeners what that looks like? Yeah, so today I, I run uh, Herd Dog, which is a company that I'm CEO of. Uh, wasn't the founder, but was brought in to kind of help get the company back up and going and get new technology added in the industry. But uh, that's just one hat. I I still uh, feed cattle at our our family feed yard here, and well, kind of depends on who you ask. Some people will say Western Nebraska, some people say Central Nebraska. We're west of Kearney, but still east of North Platte, so uh, mm-hmm. right on the Platte Valley. Uh, so I still feed cattle there. Um, I'm there working at uh, least at once a week uh, on different projects, feed mill projects, uh, cattle induction software, carcass data, all sorts of things like that for our operation and for getting da- data back to our customers. Uh, so I spend a lot of time with our uh, office staff on that. Uh, we do run uh, a commercial cow herd. And my brother-in-law runs a purebred cow herd. So uh, calving season's coming up. I just... Uh, installed a new security and camera system into all of our barns and I'm going to be back here to help with calving. So I still maintain an active role in the family businesses. Um, I do do some consulting for uh, other ranching operations kind of around the country. Like you said, I travel a lot uh, for herd dog, but also for some consulting, um, mainly on uh, technology management uh, and not just technology like herd dog, but you know, what vaccines to use, Mm -hmm. implants, plants, programs, things like that, uh, working with different supply chain partners. So um, yeah, I wear a lot of other hats, but that's probably the best uh, description of what I do in terms of day in, day out, you know, cowboying all the way up to meeting with other CEOs. So. I I appreciate you talking about the different types of technology, because sometimes I think we overcomplicate what technology is when really technology can be simple. It's a tool that helps us. So Exactly. And there's there's broad range of technologies. And and so we have to be careful when we just say that word. But, um, you know, I, I uh, will, will jokingly say in the feedlot, full technology cattle uh, and no technology cattle. And full technology cattle might mean full traceability, genomics, but it also might mean an implant and antibiotics and a, and a ionophore uh, or mm-hmm. beta, you know, so. Um, we, we try to find those into different programs and, and different things that customers want to see. Now, in the past, you've traveled and lived abroad, correct? 
Yes. Yes. Pretty, pretty extensively. I'm, I'm one of the few Nebraskans that holds a passport and uses it. <laughs> well, I think you could say that about a lot of Americans and Midwesterners in general, too. I've never used mine. I have one, but I haven't had it. I haven't, well, I haven't made the chance to use it yet. So with you, I guess, talk a little bit about why you went abroad and like what you were doing in the ag space when you were abroad, just so people get a little bit of idea of what you've been involved with in the past. Yeah. So I originally went abroad in 2018. Um, I was doing mission trips in Africa and kind of saw a big need for um, you know, obviously the, the mission of the church we we're with, but um, just the the kind of raw agricultural potential of all the land around us that nobody seemed to either realize or capitalize on or do anything about. So that kind of put a spark in my brain. Um, but I, I didn't get back to Africa for a few years. Um, but when I came back, I wanted to travel more. So um, I set up an opportunity to go study economics in Scotland uh, at the University of Aberdeen. They've got a really good international economics and trade program. Um, so I did a semester there and kind of spent my weekends going out and looking at Angus cattle up in the mountains and, you know, having this idyllic, you know, Scottish ag student experience. Because uh, we do raise Angus and some Angus cattle here. So it's neat mm -hmm. to get back to the birthplace. Um, and then uh, the second half of that year, I went to Australia. And I worked uh, at a, a purebred uh, Angus bull stud um, that sold a lot of bulls out into the outback for crossbreeding for Angus programs. And so they did a lot of genomics work with Brahmins, uh, Baran, and uh, Thule Industries over there. And then kind of brought back Angus genetics into it. Um, and then I worked for a large cattle feed yard, which was tied to uh, AA Co, so a ma major agricultural holding company that have about 14 stations. And so we were the feedlot, one of the two feedlot stations. Um, and I really wanted to do that because I wanted to see things, a, a different mindset of how cattle are raised, a different uh, economic system around, you know, feeding cattle, grass feeding cattle, what makes sense for different types of cattle, uh, and then just see how do they do it at scale? You know, I mean, we we ran 5,000 head with four guys and uh, on a on a bull stud, you know, collecting all the same data, doing all the same things purebred guys have to do here and just and just having to do it at a bigger scale and and do it year round. There was no frost over there. So we were constantly having to, um, you know, be in summer mode all the time, it seemed like. Um, and then at the cattle station, you know, we we were running a very high number of cows uh, per employee. Uh, I couldn't even tell you the number off the top of my head, but, you know, just the vast amount of work that you could get out of one person by eliminating inefficiencies in the system. And so I've tried to bring that mindset back. Um, I did get a chance to go over to Russia when all of that was happening with taking U.S. genetics to Russia. Um, I was AI technician in college, so I went over and bred cows one summer. Uh, we bred 3,600 head in eight days. Um, and then I stayed for the duration of the summer doing all the the bull quarantine work and everything for our cleanup rules and uh, eventually decided Russia was not for me and came home. <laughs> but, um, and then, yeah, lately, uh, I guess pre COVID for about 18 months, I lived in East Africa. Uh, we were building a large commercial seed uh, operation for uh, kind of private seed companies in East Africa, but we do work with Corteva and uh, we're doing work with Pan Air, which is uh, or Paneer, which is Pioneer's brand in Africa. So, uh, yeah, we're raising uh, seed corn and seed beans and uh, kind of grazing cattle around the edges, using them more as a tool for weeding and uh, pressure than anything else. Um, but uh, yeah, it was good eye opening experience and a great opportunity uh, till COVID hit. But that that's what brought me home. So I'm not uh, necessarily mad about COVID. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've you certainly have an extensive background in all that you've done and continue to do. But with that, what are some of those main challenges you have seen in the cow calf space and are continuing to see today that the, you think the industry uh, as ranchers um, needs to kind of be more aware of and focus on and recognize as a true challenge. Yeah, I, I mean, there's a, there's a myriad of issues and, and they go all the way. I, I see all the way from, you know, genomic, gen genetics and genomics operations all the way through to, you know, when they walk into the plant. And uh, 
Uh, and even in our own family business, I see that. But, you know, everybody in the, in the middle part of the industry, everybody talks about labor. It's a constant issue. It's going to continue to plague us. Um, you know, I, I read a lot of macroeconomic trends and, and you know, population in the U.S. is not leaning in our favor. When, when I was in school, uh, which was a few years before you, we were in a similar mm -hmm. program. Um, they said, you know, 2% of the two percent of the U.S. needs the, the other 98%. And then uh, I was watching the Purdue football game this year with Nebraska, and they ran an ad that said 1% feeds 99%. I said, that's a big jump in 10 years. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I've, been, I've still again. been saying 2% or hearing 2%. So I'd be curious to when they made that switch to one feeds 99. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, it was the uh, Purdue University actually ran, ran the ad during the football game this year. And I, I started looking into it and I said, yeah, it's it's a lot closer to one than it is to two. So I guess they made the switch sometime mm -hmm. in the last year. Um, so labor continues to be an issue and uh, a skilled labor is certainly a big part of that. You know, we have a lot of young people that are coming in that, you know, they, they necessarily didn't grow up on farms. My my wife's a great example. She Her family is an ag background, but her parents primarily worked in, in cities um, on the eastern side of South Dakota, Sioux Falls and some of the little towns around there. Um, her dad was a mechanic, um, you know, grew up on a ranch. She would go back to the ranch in the summers, but didn't have that experience. But, you know, she married me and she got thrown into everything. She goes and sorts cows and she's on horses and she loves that part of the life you know, as much as she can get it. So, um, you know, but we've, my family's had learned to be patient with her. She didn't grow up in it, but she's labor and she shows up when we need her to. And, and so I think uh, there will be labor challenges. There will be challenges with skilled labor and the older generations are going to have to be patient with the people who do want to be involved. Um, you know, we can't be choosy. Um, so, so that's a big issue and, and giving people technology that can help them help train people faster or, or help solve some of those solutions and inefficiencies in the labor we do have is going to be a big piece of it. The other big trend I'm seeing, and this is primarily looking at the feedlot back to our ranch customers, because we are a custom feeder. So 90% uh, of the cattle in our feed yard are still, a lot of them are still rancher owned. Uh, so we work with ranchers from Alberta to Southern Missouri and all the way as far west as California, sending cattle to us, trusting us to feed them to market. And um, we see it with a lot of our customers. Um, we, we're seeing this trend towards programs and programs are a great thing if you know how to manage, not just to the program, but manage to get your cattle into a lot of programs. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of our customers go really hard down one path uh, to get some kind of value add. Um, and then if that program went away or they did one little thing wrong and their cattle got kicked out, they were right back with all the commodity cattle that they were trying to get away from. And so I started advising people, okay, if you want to be this specific NHTC program uh, and you've bred your cattle to be um, you know, really successful in that program, let's look at some of the other programs around it that are similar, uh, but maybe slightly, you know, maybe a slightly low, lower premium, but also a slightly lower bar to get in and let's make sure we check all of their boxes as well so if that program goes away you still have a value addition for the cattle that you work so hard on any one of these other four marketing options you're not just going right back to the commodity business that you were um had a really good uh, actually on my consulting business had a really good client in colorado that they wanted to do large grass-fed organic uh, and they had the land and the resources to do that well the First year, they went to sell their organic calves. They didn't have a name yet, so they didn't have a, a lined up system. So they sold them on Superior. A guy in Western Kansas buys them. They call him and they said, "What, uh, you know, what, what do you end up doing? What program did they go into?" He goes, "Oh, I bought them because they were organic, and I knew I could stick an implant in them, and they'd be perfect. They'd just take right off." And you know, kind of upset uh, my client. And I said, "Well, hey, like, you still got the value you wanted out of them." If, if they wanted to pay that for cattle, they were going to put an implant in that's on the feedlot. But mm -hmm. uh, so this year, you know, let's look at, okay, let, if you want to raise them organic, fine. If you're not part of a program yet, fine. But there's a lot of things under organic. If they're organic, you can still qualify for natural. You can still qualify for NHTC. You can still, there's 20 other things you can qualify for if you want to take them the next step and, and retain value. And so, 
you know, I, I tell people don't box yourself in. A lot of programs are coming online. It's a trend we're going to continue to see in this industry. Uh, you know, some people call it the small beef trend where you, you also see a lot more uh, ranchers selling directly, right? Um, but you're going to see bigger brands doing things too. When I was in Australia, and this was 14 years ago now, uh, um, when I was in Australia, they had brands for everything. Um, every major company, JBS in Australia had nine brands. Um, so they would bring in all these cattle, some of them special and some of them just commodity cattle, but they had different ways to sort all of those cattle. So they didn't just have beef coming out the other end. They had a branded product for almost every animal coming in. Um, even you'd see these big, you know, seven foot tall Brahmins coming in off the outback. You're like, what brand are those going to go into? Well, they had a historic brand that was based on Brahmin specs grass-fed Brahmin specs, and they could take all those Brahmin cattle and put them right into that brand. And so, um, you know, it, it was interesting for me to see that even the big corporations doing things at massive scale, we're still thinking about how do we add value because you can't just sell beef anymore. Um, in that market, there were a few years ahead of us, you couldn't just sell beef. You had to sell the story. And I think that's, you know, we've heard this a lot, but it, it's going to become bigger and bigger and bigger as we face pressure, pressure from other proteins. I, I don't really, I tell ranchers, don't, don't get mad at your neighbor or the rancher down the road or a state away. We're all in the beef industry. Uh, we are competing with fish. We are competing with chicken. We are competing with pork. Um, people are very selective about the protein they eat. So if beef is the most expensive, um, we've got to tell the story and we've got to give them an eating experience that they enjoy. Um, you know, our, our generation certainly is willing to pay more for food, mm -hmm. but they want to know more about that food and they want to, they want to have the story around it. Right. You know, I'm not an influencer. Uh, I, I don't do a lot on social media, uh, but you know, everybody around me does and they have all these influencers, you know, cleaning products, like, you know, my, my mom and my mother-in-law and my wife are, Oh, this person tells we got to try this. We got to try this. And I'm like, it's a cleaning product. Yeah, but. And it could, it could, that influencer could be one of their best friends who it, it might only <laughs> have like really 50 people. Like you don't have, it does, an influencer doesn't have to be a large it, following to be making an impact and telling a story because it ripples down. And that's a huge exactly. thing with advocacy too. And those are mm -hmm. probably the more, I don't want to say more effective because I know some very effective larger scale influencers but those micro influencers as they're being called are extremely effective from a trust standpoint. Absolutely. Absolutely. The best, uh, the, the best local beef influencer I've ever met is an attorney in Lincoln. He, he buys beef from one of the little slaughterhouses here in central Nebraska. And uh, you know, he'll, he'll buy the steer. It's a low, it's a state run packing plant. So it's not federally inspected. So he'll buy the steer and have it slaughtered. And then he'll go tell all of his attorney buddies and doctor buddies in Lincoln and Omaha, hey, I bought this steer from this rancher and then you can kill it at this butcher shop. You get the whole thing. They tell it. And he's just so vocal about it that I have these random lawyers from Lincoln and Omaha calling me saying, hey, can you connect us with somebody that has a steer? Or could you can could you get us a half of beef or quarter beef? And it's just like we went from like me selling a quarter or a half a year to a lawyer or maybe a full steer to, you know, we're doing like 40 or 50 head a year just as a little side thing uh, for my brother and sister-in-law and some local ranchers here. And I said, look, I mean, you guys don't even have to work that hard. If you got four or five guys like this, you know, that's a whole full-time business for half of you guys. <laughs> so yeah, uh, absolutely. And I, influencer, you know, but his ripple effect is huge. Yeah. And so as we're talking about, you know, this is a great way to enter into what you're doing with herd dog, because as you're talking about, these value added programs. And really what I'm kind of catching from that is understanding the value of your calves now and different avenues you can go um, to really capture that and get what they're worth. And that's something that I've talked about on my Rancher Mind series. Actually, your dad's going to be on one of the Rancher Mind calls coming up in March to talk a little bit about feedlot relationships and stuff too. That's a different topic than what we're focused on today, but it's all tied together because with those programs, producers need a way to capture data on their calves. And like you talked about with the labor standpoint, we need a way to capture that data and utilize it to make more effective management decisions. So, and that's something that herd dog has so many different options and is 
it just has, it can be applied in so many different ways to so many unique operations. I think Unique, you should talk about what her dog is to kind of talk about how this technology can play a role for the rancher. Yeah, yeah. So her dog was, uh, it's kind of this next generation of cattle wearables. So, you know, cattle wearables, you know, ways of collecting data, live data off animals goes back to you know, the 90s, really. Um, early radio and pedometers and things like that on your cows. Um, and to today, you know, with her dog, we have a, a Bluetooth tag works off of the same principle as all your, your earphones and your cars and everything. It's just got a much longer range, but, um, you know, it's a Bluetooth tag, so it can collect a lot of data, can stream a lot of data, uh, either to a base station or directly to your phone. If you're out in the middle of nowhere and you don't have a base station and it pulls that data in and does a kind of really quick, fairly instant analysis to say, okay, here's your activity patterns. Here's the animals, you know, ear temp, which is kind of a, um, you know, more of a environmental temperature, but it's also influenced by the either heat release or, or uh, non-release from the animal. So if it's 106 and you have an animal that's 107, you know that they're releasing a lot more heat and they probably have some kind of issue. Um, so it's pulling that data in constantly. You know, we, we know we're pulling in data uh, because of how we designed it every six minutes, 24 hours a day. So you're getting 480 data points per animal per day. Uh, it's like having a set of eyes on that cow all the time. Um, you know, imagine if you could tell your activity, your animal every six minutes of the day, there's a lot of things you can do with that. So where we focus that technology early on for the rancher is estrus. Um, we're seeing a, you're seeing a huge uptick in AI and in timed breeding. Uh, if, even if they're not using AI, they're using some form of timed breeding with bulls. Um, so estrus detection, um, uh, we're looking really hard into calving right now. Um, we're, we're fairly confident we can get a strong calving algorithm after this season. We've got enough tags out now. We've got enough feedback coming in. Uh, like we tell people, if there's something you want an algorithm for, we can build it. We just need observable data. Um, we need tags on your cows and we need good observations back from you. And we can kind of work on you, work with you to get that algorithm what you need. Um, and then illness. Illness is the big one we spent a ton of time on because it doesn't, you know, that doesn't just go for the rancher, it goes for the feedlot or the calf ranch if you're in the dairy industry background or dairy cows, all cattle get sick. And we need to be able to find those cattle early. Our goal is to find them two to three days before a human being would normally see them um, and get in with an early administration of either um, a drug, uh, you know, some kind of antibiotic, like a lower grade antibiotic. You don't have to hit them with Drax or Beatrol right off the bat. You can give them something weaker like LA 200 and usually they're just fine. Uh, we've got a producer that every time they've flagged, uh, he's given them transdermal banamine because he knows he's catching them early enough. He just wants to break that fever and get them out of it. And, and he's had incredible success. So he, he said, I haven't even hit these calves with a needle. Well, that's, that's a fantastic story to tell because transdermal banamine is not an antibiotic. It, it, you know, you can keep those cattle in a lot of programs, mm -hmm. uh, and you're not hitting them with a needle. So if you're keeping replacements, you know, every time you have to treat a replacement heifer, the odds of her falling out of your herd earlier goes up. So his is all about how do I keep the needles out? How do I manage these things better for my herd uh, going forward? So, you know, her dog's really a data analytics company that built an ear tag <laughs> to get the data. And, uh, you know, so we, we push hard into data, mm -hmm. um, obviously because we're collecting data every six minutes, 24 hours a day, we, we know where that data is collected based on where your phone is or where the base station that's reading the data is. So we can also give you a level of traceability and transparency into that traceability. You know, when did they check in over here versus over here? Did they leave the property and check in somewhere else? Uh, did they check into a truck driver's phone as they were going down the road? You know, there's there's all these different things we can do on the shipping and trend and you know transparency of transportation side uh, that just continue to further increase value for people trying to keep their cattle in programs or just know where they are. Uh, you know, that's a really simple one is just knowing where your cows are and if they if they're reporting in where they're supposed to be. And that's that's really one of the cool things about her dog in at least that I've thought or noticed in the conversations that we've had leading up to this is just how flexible it can be for each operation. I mean, regardless of kind of what your goal is, um, 
really where you're headed. If you are a cow calf producer, there's more than likely and more than one way that herd dog can allow you to collect data to help you make more effective management decisions. So I also want to talk about, you know, go back to that labor standpoint. You talked about how, you know, labor, that's a challenge. And I've been hearing this since, I mean, I guess I'm only 24, but I've been hearing it since I was in junior high or high school, right? Like even when dad had everyone home to help, it always felt like we never had enough help. And then my sister and I were both gone and then it was just mom and dad. And it's like, it's just labor is a challenge. And my husband and I see it on our own operation today. So how is this technology impacting that labor component for cattle producers? Because I know some people might say, well, now I have the data that takes more time to manage it, which is more labor, but then also how can it help reduce labor as well? Yeah. So you know, I, I look at it, it's, it's going to depend on how you use it, but, uh, you know, guys that go from once a day breeding, uh, because they don't have time to go and do heat checks. Uh, you could now do accurate heat checks and do time breeding, uh, to the cow. So your, your increase in efficiency, if you're artificially inseminating those animals will go up significantly because you're going to go back to a natural program. Um, and we've, we've seen over and over again, when you're on a natural program, you're, you're saving money because you're not having to give all the sink drugs but you're just also able to get a better response to that semen, or if you're using embryos, much better response to the embryos. Um, and you're not going to go out there every hour and see which cow's riding, right? <laughs> it's going to tell you this cow was riding. Here's your, here's your heat window, right? Um, so that, that's a big labor savings for people that are in focused on, you know, improving through reproductive means, whether it's AI or embryos. Um, Another thing that we're working on, this is why we're specifically working on calving is, you know, we will check cows every two to four hours when we're calving because we, we calve heavy and we, we sink everything. So it's, it's a lot of work, but if we could take that from every, uh, let's say every, let's say on average, every three hours with, with two, three guys to every five hours, uh, with two, two guys, cause we now know exactly what's calved or what needs attention, um, we can now split guys off to go do other things because uh, there, there's a you're not going to get rid of people there's always something that needs done that didn't get done it's just allowing us to get some of those hours back in our day to get those things done um well and i think this, not to interrupt but even on the calving side when you look at night checks for producers who are in colder environments like being able to see that algorithm and know like okay i don't have to go out every two hours tonight because they can trust that things are going to be okay for the most part. I mean, cause that's when you go out at two in the morning and nothing's going on, it's kind of like, well, it's nice that I can go right back in, but at the same time, it was like, could have just stayed in bed. <laughs> exactly. 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 You know, you, you run out in the middle of the night uh, and I do it often. You run, you'll I'll always take like the middle of the night check. Um, cause then I can get a couple hours of sleep and I can get a few hours of sleep. I'm, for some reason, I'm groggy, but I'll always take that like one or 2 AM shift and you'll go out and you're like, Oh, all right. You know, gonna have to do something. And you'll go walk around and you're like, there's nothing. I could have just stayed in bed. <laughs> um, so it's getting, it's getting that little, that little bit of time back is valuable, but, um, you know, more importantly to us, it's, you know, how, how much are you disturbing those animals when you go out? You know, I've walked through a pet of heifers a lot and walked in to see a heifer pushing, turn around, see me and stop mm -hmm. pushing. And she wasn't having any issue before I got there. So to be able to watch that animal and say, okay, she started, I'm just going to watch her for an hour to see if, see if it changes, see if her activity changes, see if there's, see if her temperature spikes, you know, anything that's going to happen uh, that now tells me I have to go help, right? That's what we're really looking at. And, and we're not quite there yet, but as again, as we get more data, we get more observable data. So observations back from producers, we can start to act on that and create more sophisticated algorithms for producers. Um, so it's really looking forward and saying, okay, what do people want it? What, what, do, what do people want to use it for in the next five years, right? Um, I, I had somebody say, well, you know, I tried those, uh, neck collars. That's another great technology is these virtual fencing neck collars. Mm -hmm. uh, they said, but you know, it was, it was overkill for what I wanted to do. Um, I really just want to know if they're in or if they're out and my pastures are next to a highway. And I said, well, 
you know, we can set the alerts to be more time sensitive. So not every 20 minutes, but every 10 minutes or every five minutes. And we could position our base stations so that the edge of the range is the fence perimeter. And now if that cat, if your cows leave range, it'll send you an alert and you know, to go put them back in, um, you know, and that's a lot of, you know, what wasn't what we designed it for. We just designed to tag with a lot of uses, um, but it's something they want to use it for. Um, you know, they don't necessarily, they need the, the power of uh, events or a caller, um, but they, they need something. They know they need something. Will our solution fit? Can we help them make it fit? Um, so yeah, a lot of what we do is just how, how can we help you solve your problems? If our technology is the best fit, obviously we're going to use our technology. If it's not, I spend a lot of time with other technology companies. Uh, you know, Jack Keating was in the same program. I was, you know, he's with Caller. There's a lot of these that we can bounce back and forth and say, hey, you need to go talk to this guy or you need to go talk to this guy. I think my background growing up on a ranch and a custom feed yard, uh, especially the custom feed yard side of me tells you, we tell customers all the time, you know, we may not be the best feed yard for your cattle. Here's a great yard, or we don't have room. Here's a better yard to go to that's closer to you or better basis or something. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you've got to be in the business of solving people's problems. That's how, if you solve their problems, you create customers, right? So, um, we, we try and solve problems. Another thing that, um, we did put a light on these tags, a really ultra bright uh, daylight visible LED light, but at nighttime, it looks like you can light up cattle like a Christmas tree. And so I've seen guys that'll create a heavy list uh, of what they think is due um, or the cows they've pulled up into their pen. And then they'll they'll just say, uh, okay, I'm going to physically check them, but I'm going to turn on the lights of the ones I want to check. And then, you know, in a pen of 200 cows, they got four and they go, okay, there's one there, 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 and there. So now they're not walking the whole pen. They're looking at the ones that need attention and they're going on with the rest of their day. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing with illness. You can, you can ride your pasture for hours or you can just turn on the 10 head that need attention. Uh, and you may treat them, you may not treat them, but those are the ones you know you needed to look at. Jack has been on the show before to talk about virtual fencing and a part of the Rancher Mind program too, to share some of that. It's He's got a lot of cool stuff going on that can definitely help cattle producers if that's what they're looking for. And with what you're doing too, I mean, I think that's just so important. Like you said, you're in the business of solving problems for people because whether you're the solution or not, you can help cattle producers, you can help feedlots, you can help whoever it is you're helping in the beef industry find what they're looking for. And I think that's something we all need to remember is that we need to collaborate and not be so competitive within the industry itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, a, a great example to me is a, is a really young kind of cattleman coming into the industry. I was, uh, I would spend a lot of time out at, uh, the bull shows at Denver cause I would fit bulls for people in college. And, uh, uh my great uncle was a, was a big bull breeder here in Nebraska, Angus bull breeder. And I actually got a job with one of his kind of rival breeders. Um, and, and I, I knew the two were, you know, kind of somewhat friends. Um, but both of them actually um, helped each other's business so much. They would literally bring customers to the other producer's sale and say, oh, these bulls will work better for you than some of the bulls I have. I'll mm -hmm. breed bulls in the future, but what you need right now is at this guy's sale. And, and they were so collaborative, even though they were competitors in a fairly small region, right? Um, but it made you know, people knew that and people trusted both of them and both uh, as a result, both of their businesses flourished. So yeah, we, we need to be in the business of solving problems, not just trying to be the lowest cost producer or, or, or try and undercut our neighbors or, you know, tear anybody down and say, well, I raise the way I raise cattle is better than the way he raises cattle. Well, cattle are healthy and they make it to market. I think we're, I think you're doing a good job. <laughs> um, yep. And if the consumer has a good eating experience after that, Exactly. Exactly. A plus, you got it. <laughs> path they took could be very different. Um, and every path has its challenges, but, um, you know, we need to look at how, you know, the value we create and how we want to market it, not necessarily tear down somebody else's marketing. That's, that's the issue I've had with some of the, you know, outside groups that have come in and tried to influence the industry. Uh, and you can tell them pretty fast. It's, it's the people that are 
pointing fingers saying you have to do this because everything else you do is wrong, you know, that that tends to not be uh, somebody from inside the industry, right? Right. So, you know, you, I didn't intend to go on a cattle marketing rabbit hole earlier, but I really liked what you were talking about because that's something that, you know, it's important to everyone. Everyone's marketing their cattle in some form or fashion. And I know whether it's my listeners or my membership, cattle marketing is something they're always craving more information on. So with herd dog, are there ways to collect some of that data that is relevant to the cattle marketing side and helping people figure out which value added programs they may fit into because there are so many programs out there that producers can be a part of. So does Herd Doug have the capability to either capture some of that important data or maybe input some of it extra so that it's tied to each animal? What what are the capabilities there? Yeah, so we're we're looking at creating you know somewhat of an insights portal, uh, which could be on a on an industry level basis of you know, these are the types of cattle that are using more antibiotics or or these are the type of cattle that are performing better from a health perspective or, you know, they're moving more, they're eating more, all of this uh, for different programs like NHTC or natural. So so you, we'd like to partner with genomics companies. We're in conversations about how do we do that to collect that data, put it into a usable format so people can see the animals as they, as they come online with herd dog, they can see the animals, they can look at their behavior, they can look at their health status and they can say, okay, early on, I'm going to make this decision or this decision and I can sort my cattle different ways. So that's, that's the forward leading edge of what herd dog is trying to do is that kind of broader industry mm-hmm. insight and then bringing it down to an individual producer's cattle. Um, it's just, you know, but to do that takes collaboration. You know, we've got to work with genomics companies. We've got to work with other data collection companies because we need to know what's happening to those cattle outside of just their activity and their temperature and their behavior. Right. Um, but with that, we do collect a lot more data than pretty much anybody so on, on a per head basis. So we can start to do that. Um, the other thing that we, you know, that I'm looking at even on my own cattle is, if I want to go into the, the, the right now, the highest value program that's kind of commoditized would be some one of the natural programs. So if I want to keep my cattle natural, I cannot give an antibiotic and I can't use feed additives or hormones, certain feed additives or hormones. Mm-hmm. So we we'll talk about technology. I consider all of those technologies. So that to me is a technology light program. Well, if I'm using herd dog, there are feed additives that are natural feed additives. Uh, that can have a very similar effect to CTC, but you have to get the animals very early in that disease cycle, right? So if I'm using herd dog, can I catch enough of the animals early enough that I can intervene with an all natural feed product and keep that pen of cattle uh, or that that herd of calves that's weaning, keep them natural longer? Because the longer I can keep them in a high value program, like, like I said earlier, the more options I have. You know, if it comes to the point where I have to use an antibiotic, okay, well, I'll use an antibiotic, and then I can put them in an NHTC program. They're not performing. They're still having issues with death loss. Maybe then I'll pull them out, give them a growth promotant, and and put them back into a more commoditized, you know, general beef industry program. So, you know, we want to use that data to say, how do we catch things early? How do we manage the cattle better to fit into these different slots? And know when to, you know, the, the worst thing you could do is try and keep cattle in a program that they aren't a good fit for. And and you just keep putting money into those cattle and then eventually they fall out of the program. You want to be able to make that decision as early as you can. Yeah. So we have covered a lot of ground in 30, 40 minutes, wherever we're at now. I think we're closer to 40. Um, and I I mean, we could probably talk for three hours about all this stuff with as much as you're doing and um, just the exciting capabilities of technology today. But as we kind of wrap up the conversation and think, and and you think about the cow-calf industry 10, 15, or even 20 years from now, what do you think commercial cow-calf producers need to be keeping in mind as they start setting themselves up to move forward? Yeah, I think, I think you always need to look at what, what technology is doing in the rest of the world and, and 
at least ask the question or be curious to say, what are those technologies going to do in my world? Um, so, you know, her dog, you know, one of the nicknames for her dog is the Fitbit for cattle. Um, we saw, and especially during COVID, an explosion of wearable watches uh, for people that could tell you pretty early on if you were developing COVID symptoms. Um, you know, I, I know people that wear the, I have, I have epilepsy and I know people, a lot of people that have epilepsy that wear them to track seizures uh, or they wear them for heart conditions monitoring. Um, so that, that is directly correlated to what her dog is trying to do in cattle down the road, right? Um, you know, it's the, it's the exact same thing. We're, we're looking at all these electric cars coming into the vehicle. And I know some people think that's a fad, depending on the day, I think it's a fad. Um, but uh, my grandpa, who's, who's a big tractor guy, he looks at it and he says, well, hey, an electric, electric generated tractor would actually have more torque, you know? So we need to, okay, if the batteries get good enough and the life gets good enough, is that going to change our tractors? Probably, probably could, probably might or will. So we can't ignore what's going on in the rest of the world and think that ranching's isolated. We need to, we, we need it. Like I said, we need to be curious. We need to, you know, look at those things. Uh, All right, Andrew. Well, thank you for being on the show today. And I know I've, I definitely got a lot out of this interview. There's no doubt in my mind that those listening got even more out of it. Um, this is definitely one of those that you may even want to listen to more than once just to pick up on something else each time you listen. But before we wrap up, do you have any final thoughts you want to share? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the big thing I think about every day and what keeps me up and, and excited about the industry is the is the amount of big data and technology that is coming into the industry. And, uh, you know, we talked about the labor problem and we talked about, you know, how, how we're going to get around that you know, we, we will attract more young people back into the industry uh, with some of this technology, with some of the things that excite people again. Um, you know, the the dairy industry, not that uh, I want to compare ranchers to dairies, but the, but the dairy industry has certainly found a way to get more technology. They got more of their life back and they're seeing more and more of their kids come back to the dairies because they don't have to milk cows twice a day anymore. They've got automated milkers and all this other stuff. And, and they're seeing bigger uh, generational transfers and, and, and they're seeing those people come back in. And so I think if we can adopt even a percentage of that uh, level of technology or that technology mindset about being curious with these new technologies, you are going to see more people come back in. Um, you're going to see more food companies that want to integrate directly with ranchers and work directly with them to create value. Um you know, and, and, and big data, what we're doing at Herd Dog, you know, data analytics and insights, all of that kind of sits at the core of, you know, how do we make better animals that fit the consumer palate and and are more, you know, uh, efficient to run on grass and, and easier for the ranchers to manage. All of that goes into that package around big data. All right. Well, thank you again, and you have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Jay. Appreciate you having me on. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. For more information about Herd Dog, if you want to connect with Andrew, feel free to reach out to me on my website. But more importantly, head to the Herd Dog website. All those links are in the show notes once you finish listening to the episode. Have a great day.